A recent report reveals the world's nearly 3,000 billionaires increased their wealth by $5 trillion last year, a rate unprecedented in human history, which prompts Mark Whitaker to ask, when is more than enough enough? So, Roy Disney was your grandfather. Yeah. When your last name is Disney, you get to see how the magic is made. And you went to the parks with him uh, yeah. as a child? Yeah, when I was little, yeah. we would walk in the back way with him, right. which was sort of cool, because once I saw Mickey without his head. <laughs> <laughs> Abigail Disney is the granddaughter of Roy O. Disney, who, along with his brother Walt, started the Disney empire. She's inherited millions of dollars, seen the gilded life up close. But these days, she thinks that great wealth isn't necessarily so magical. I really believe that money ruins people. How are you Disney doing? is now a social activist and documentary filmmaker. There's this bug called the Japanese beetle and it eats the tree out from the inside and the tree looks completely fine until it falls over. I think money is like that. You develop a pattern of thinking and feeling that is, um, that's corrosive. Which has led her to turn a critical lens on the family biz. She's criticized the multi-million dollar salary of now former Disney CEO Bob Iger and just released a documentary that looks at income inequality in the U.S. economy in general and specifically at pay and working conditions for Disney employees. How many of you know somebody who works at Disney who slept in their car in the last oh. couple of years? This is my name. This is my family. I don't have a role at the company. But I'm benefiting by the exploitation of these people. For its part, Disney told us, the well-being and aspirations of our employees and cast will always be our top priority. That starts with fair pay. What really appalls Abigail Disney is some of the behavior of the super rich. Three, two, one. Like when Richard Branson and Jeff Bezos launched themselves into orbit. So Jeff Bezos said when he came back to Earth. I also I want to thank uh, every Amazon employee. And he wanted to thank Amazon Amazon's employees and customers because you paid for all of this. What was yeah. your reaction to that? Yeah. <laughs> I threw up in my mouth a little bit. <laughs> the idea that he didn't understand the insult that he was making there when he said, thank you for paying for my trip to outer space for, what was it, 20 minutes? He didn't hear what he was saying, and, and there wasn't a single employee there at the ground level who didn't take that as an insult. And I, certainly a lot of customers took it as an insult. The wealth gap has reached stratospheric levels. The richest 1% of Americans now has almost 13 times the wealth of the bottom 50%. It's led some to consider, maybe you can be too rich. The examples are there. Professor Ingrid Robains teaches philosophy and ethics at Utrecht University in the Netherlands. She's been promoting a concept called limitarianism. Define limitarianism. So limitarianism is just a word for the thought that there should be a moral limit to how much wealth you can accumulate. So it's the idea that it's fine to be well off, but at some point one has uh, too much. Robaines is talking mainly about the really rich, and there are more of them than ever. Since 1990, the number of billionaires in the U.S. has grown from 66 to 745. Robaines believes the case against the super-rich isn't just moral. It's also environmental. From the profits of businesses that haven't paid for polluting the atmosphere to the emissions from mega-mansions and private planes and the unused dollars just sitting in offshore accounts. There is money in the hands of those who are super wealthy that is not used for meeting their needs. It's used for luxury spending or for accumulating further and further, whereas we have this massive problem of climate change that also needs funding. The world's wealthiest 1% are believed to use double the carbon emissions of the bottom 50%. So where to draw the bottom line on wealth? In America, you now have the saying, there shouldn't be any billionaires. Every billionaire is a policy failure. And my initial reaction is, no, a billion is way too much. And so whatever your line would be, it would be under a billion. Yes, absolutely. 
I think you can have a fully flourishing life and do all the things you want with, well, perhaps, perhaps not with 10 million, but then with 20 million. I don't think you need a billion. Do you think that there's a point at which it becomes a problem for an individual, but also for society, when not just one person, but a whole class of people has vastly more wealth than anybody else in the society? I don't think that's inherently a problem. Vivek Ramaswamy is an entrepreneur who made more than a few dollars as the founder of a biopharmaceutical company. I'm not going to be here telling you that capitalism is a perfect system, but I will tell you that I think it is the least imperfect system in ultimately lifting up people who are at the bottom. And there's the argument about See incentives, it, that you too could become the next Bill Gates. I think that's hogwash. My grandfather wasn't interested in money primarily. Anybody who's just there for the money, thank you very much. I don't want to work with them. So rich people say, I did this, I took the risk or I, whatever I did, uh, so it's mine, I deserve it. But the truth is take any of these billionaires on a deserted island and just look at what they can do. They can do nothing, they can survive. So that means for all of us, our um, quality of life and the degree to which we can flourish depends on what others do. Limitarians also raise concerns about the outsized impact that the wealthy have on society, from politics to philanthropy. And it can, of course, be that you just fund somebody who's standing for office or, and who then becomes a president or a member of Congress. It can also be that you, for example, buy up or heavily fund, say, university institutes. And in that way, you shape the way the public conversation is going. So th these are ways in which you can turn financial wealth into a political power. I don't think it's right for a private individual, a group of individuals, to have that much say in the direction of, of social issues that all of us are affected by. It's one libertarian point that Vivek Ramaswamy agrees with. He's criticized corporations and the wealthy for exerting their influence on social issues. The source of equality that I think we need to restore isn't an equality of wealth. It isn't a redistribution of wealth. It is a restoration of the idea that we are equal as citizens. I prefer to talk about not a redistribution of wealth, but a redistribution of duty. A startling new study just out finds that the world's 10 richest men more than doubled their fortunes during the first two years of the pandemic, while income levels for the 99% of people around the globe actually fell. From a real world perspective, how realistic is what you're talking about, uh, lim putting an absolute limit on wealth? Yeah, it's a very good question. So philosophers need to ask questions that uh, make people think, even if they disagree. So I think that's my role. I do not believe that um, in my lifetime there will be any country that has a genuine limit on wealth. But here's one last thing to think about. If recent history is any guide, in just the eight minutes it took to watch this story, Jeff Bezos' wealth increased by a million dollars.